Welcome to this channel, Chem Exam Explained, where we will go through various past paper questions and I'll do my best to explain as best as possible. Uh, for this video, we are doing Cape Chemistry Unit 1, Paper 2. We are starting with Module 1, Fundamentals of Chemistry, and the first question, 1A, Part 1 and Part 2, is asking us to state each of the following laws. So let's look at Boyle's law, and then we'll examine Charles' law. For the first one, Boyle's law states that for a fixed mass of gas, volume is inversely proportional to pressure at constant temperature. Now the expression for that is P is inversely proportional to volume, plus pressure is inversely proportional to volume, or volume is inversely proportional to pressure at constant temperature. Now notice again that instead of using a fixed mass of gas, we could use a fixed number of moles of gas. The diagrams you see on the side here is showing you that if you increase pressure, you are actually decreasing volume. For Charles' law, it states that for a fixed mass of gas, volume is directly proportional to temperature at constant pressure. The expression is volume is directly proportional to temperature at constant pressure. Again, the drawing on the sides here is showing you that if you increase temperature, the volume will increase. Hence, volume and temperature are directly proportional to each other at constant pressure. Part B. List four assumptions made about gas molecules in the kinetic molecular theory with reference to ideal gases. Now, the question asks for four. Here, I list five. You can always give any four. One, gas molecules are in constant random motion. Two, the molecules occupy negligible volume when compared to the volume occupied by the gas. That is, the gas has no volume. Three, collisions between the gas particles are elastic. Four, the molecules exert no force on one another. That is, there are no intermolecular forces of attraction. Five, the average kinetic energy of the molecules is directly proportional to the absolute temperature of the gas. We are now looking at part C. A flask has a mass of 47.392 grams when empty and 47.816 grams when filled with acetone vapor at 100 degrees Celsius and 745 millimeter mercury. If the volume of the flask is 247.3 milliliter, what is the molar mass of the acetone? We were given the molar gas constant as 0.0821 liter atmosphere per mole per Kelvin. We are given the conversion factor for atmosphere to millimeter mercury, where one atmosphere equals 760 millimeter mercury. If we examine the molar gas constant here, you see that the units given are in liter for volume, atmosphere for pressure, and Kelvin for temperature. So we must change all those units to correspond to the molar gas constant. So we are going to change 100 degrees Celsius to Kelvin. To do so, we just add 273 to the 100 degrees Celsius to convert to Kelvin. So 100 degrees Celsius is equal to 373 Kelvin. To convert pressure from 745 millimeter mercury, we are going to use the conversion factor one atmosphere equals 760 millimeter mercury. To do that conversion, we simply arrange the conversion factor in a way that millimeter mercury will be cancelled. This is a conversion table. So our pressure of 745 millimeter mercury is now equal to 0 0.980 atmosphere. 
The next thing that we're going to convert is our volume of 247.3 ml. We're going to use the conversion factor. 1,000 milliliter is equal to one liter. And so we arrange that conversion factor using our conversion table to convert 247.3 ml to 0 0.2473 liters. Now we have all those conversion. We are now going to go to the question and use the relevant information to start our calculation. We are given the mass of the empty flask and we're given the mass of the flask that is filled. And so we simply subtract. So 47.816 grams is your filled flask. And we're going to subtract from that the empty flask, which is 47.392, to give us the mass of acetone, which is 0 0.424 grams. We now have the relevant information from the question where we can now use the ideal gas equation. We are going to make N, which is moles, the subject of the formula. So N is equal to now PV divided by RT, where the pressure of 0 0.980 is multiplied by the volume of 0 0.2473. And the molar gas constant of 0 0.0821 is multiplied by the temperature in Kelvin. And our answer is now in moles. Now that we have our answer in moles, we are going to use another equation, N equal M over MR, which is moles equal mass over molar mass. We are going to make molar mass the subject of the formula and the mass given in the question that we calculated is 0 0.424. We calculated that from the filled flask and the empty flask. And we are going to divide that by the calculated moles to get our molar mass of 53.67 grams per mole. So the unit of mole, N, is M-O-L-S, moles. And the unit for molar mass is gram per mole. We are now looking at 1D part 1, state Hesse's law. Now, before I state the law, let's have a basic understanding of what is happening here. If we have a reactant A and a product B, the enthalpy change for that reaction is the same as if you take an alternate route going from A to C, C to D, D to B. So Hess's law states that the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction is independent of the route taken by which the reaction proceeds. Now, part two, we're going to construct a born haber cycle for the formation of lead 2 fluoride, showing clearly using equations the steps of the enthalpy changes involved. Let's go. Now, if we are looking at the Born-Haber cycle for the formation of lead 2 fluoride, we must start with lead solid plus fluorine gas. Now, that will make our enthalpy of formation, which is exothermic. That's why the arrow goes down to produce or lead to fluoride, which is a solid. Now, what we need to know here is that the first step is the atomization of lead. So we go from lead solid to lead gas. We bring up the fluorine because nothing was done to it. Our next step is to now atomize the fluorine or dissociate the fluorine. That's what we're doing next. So I bring back up my lead, which was atomized. And now I'm going to atomize my nonmetal from fluorine molecule to 
two atoms of fluorine. Now, what you need to know is that the values given for lead solid to lead gas is the standard enthalpy change for the atomization of lead. So we just use that value in the calculation. But for the atomization of fluorine, since one molecule converted into two atoms, then the standard enthalpy change of atomization of fluorine, that value must be multiplied by two. You will see atomization or dissociation of fluorine. Our next move is to ionize the lead. That is, remove the first electron. So it is a standard enthalpy change for the first ionization energy of lead. So that will take us from lead gas to lead ion. And we bring up back the atoms of fluorine. After the first ionization, comes the second ionization. Now you could add an electron here because the electron was lost from lead atom to form lead ion. So plus electron would be useful there. Now we go to Pb2 plus. Now this is the second ionization energy. And now we had one electron there, the other electron came off. So now it is two electrons. And of course, plus our fluorine atom in the gaseous state. So we go from first IE, and now right here becomes your second IE. So it's the standard enthalpy change for the second ionization energy of lead. Our next move is to add electrons to the nonmetals. So we have two fluorine atoms, we're going to add electrons, electron to each. Therefore, this is now the standard enthalpy change for electron affinity of your fluorine atoms. So now we go back to our two plus, the gaseous state plus two F minus ions now in the gaseous state. And that is electron affinity. Now, because we added an electron to each atom, which, which are two of them, we must multiply this by two, the value by two. And when we go from gaseous ions to ionic solid, that is now called the standard enthalpy change of lattice energy or lattice enthalpy. And of course, that is just one value. So the only part that you would multiply by two is for the dissociation of the fluorine molecule and for the electron affinity of the two fluorine atoms. And this would give us our Bornheber cycle. Now, in, in doing the calculation, right here is where we'd have the standard enthalpy of formation of lead to fluoride. The formula will be Standard enthalpy of formation is equal to the standard enthalpy change of X plus the standard enthalpy change of lattice energy. What are the values for X? Now, the X values are your atomization of lead, that's X, your dissociation or atomization of fluorine, another X value. Your first ionization energy, another X value. Your second ionization of lead, another X value. And the last X value would be the electron affinity of X. So all of these would be included in the equation where X is concerned. However, we have or the question gave us the values for formation and all of these values. So the value that we're lacking or the value that we need to find is a standard enthalpy of lattice energy. So this is our unknown. So what we'll do 
is we'll make lattice energy the subject of the formula. So therefore, standard enthalpy change of lattice energy is equal to the standard enthalpy of formation minus all the other values. And this would be the formula we use in our calculation. Now, based on what I just showed you, you can see that this is now the complete Bornheber cycle. So from here now, we can go and do the calculation. Now, notice again that I gave the formula and I made lattice enthalpy the subject of the formula. Therefore, we just go to the table and we look for the relevant information. So formation would be the enthalpy of formation, which is negative 664, minus all the values I showed you that would, that would be your x values. So that would be formation minus all the values I showed you for the x, which would be your atomization of lead, your atomization of fluorine, your first ionization energy of lead, your second ionization energy of lead, and your electron affinity of the fluorine atoms. When I do that now, I plug it into the formula. I have negative 664 minus the values that were plugged in, and that will give me now negative 664 minus 1,862.88 kilojoules per mole, and my final answer is negative 2,526.88 kilojoules per mole. Be very careful with the sign, the negatives, and of course, make sure that you take your time in doing the calculation so that you get the accurate and correct answer. Part 1E of the question is asking us to state the effect of each of the following on the magnitude of lattice energy. First one is ionic charge. Now, ionic charge is directly proportional to lattice energy. Now, as you can see here, I have a single charge on sodium, a single charge on chlorine. So my chloride ion is attracting my sodium ion. And if I compare that to my calcium ion with a two plus charge and my oxide ion with a two minus charge, you'll see that the one with the higher charge would have the higher lattice energy. So ionic charge is directly proportional to lattice energy. When it comes to ionic radius, it is now the opposite. Ionic radius is inversely proportional to lattice enthalpy. What is that saying? The larger the ionic radius, the smaller the lattice energy. Let's look at part F. Now, a yellow precipitate is formed when silver nitrate solution acidified with dilute nitric acid is added to an aqueous solution containing iodide ions. One, write the simplest ionic equation for the formation of the yellow precipitate. Now, silver ion, aqueous, plus iodide ion aqueous forms an ionic solid silver iodide, which is a yellow precipitate. Part two, state the result observed when concentrated ammonia solution, which is ammonium hydroxide, is added to this yellow precipitate. Now, if you add concentrated ammonia solution to this precipitate, it will not dissolve. You could also answer by saying no visible change or no visible reaction. Part three, state why silver nitrate solution is acidified when testing for iodide ions. Now the nitric acid reacts with and removes other ions that might give a precipitate with silver nitrate. Part four, explain why dilute hydrochloric acid is not used to acidify the silver nitrate solution in this test for iodide ions. Dilute hydrochloric acid would introduce chloride ions, Cl- into the solution, which would give a white precipitate for this ion that was not initially present in the solution. So if you have silver ion 
and you introduce hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, which would produce Cl minus, would combine with the silver to form silver chloride. And of course, that would cause a precipitate to form. Now for part G. Describe the result observed when chlorine water is added to a solution of potassium bromide followed by aqueous silver nitrate. Now notice this question is not asking for any equation. However, it is best that I show you the result that you can describe or the result that will be observed. Okay, so that is why I gave you the molecular equation, also the ionic equation. So in describing the result observed, we're going to be using chlorine water, which is Cl2 aqueous, plus the salt potassium bromide to form the salt potassium chloride plus aqueous bromine. Now, aqueous bromine is the reddish brown color that will be observed for the first part of the reaction. Now, for this molecular equation, you could look also at the ionic equation by just simply removing the spectator ions, which would be the potassium. So what happened here is that the chlorine being a stronger oxidizing agent than bromine, it will displace the bromine from the salt, forming potassium chloride. And the bromine that was displaced would form that reddish brown color. In the second part of the question, it is asking, that you describe what you observe after you add the silver nitrate. Now remember that the chlorine displaced the bromine, thereby forming chloride ions. And once you have these chloride ions present in the solution, the silver ion would combine with the chloride ions to form the ionic solid silver chloride, which is a white precipitate. So the answer, is really a reddish brown color of bromine appears and a white precipitate of silver chloride is formed.